Okay, so let's welcome to the second uh, meeting of the peer-to-peer -peer of the project group peer-to-peer -peer framework for social networks. So what I will talk about today is a little bit more. Okay. Okay. So what I will talk about is a little bit more on, um, uh, on organizations or how the lectures we wanted to find a new time slot for it. A uh, little bit on the seminar topics, so we I presented the last time the seminar topics, now we had the assignment. Let me just uh, do it this way. Okay. Uh, then the first part that is needed is will be the paper structure. We'll talk a little bit about that, so what it is and what uh, you are required to, to how sh it should look like, because that's what interests you. How to do it in EasyChair. And then uh, we start with the lecture, so getting into peer-to-peer -peer what it um, is and all that. So if you visited the um, lecture peer-to-peer -peer networks and applications last semester, there are the slides are partly from that. Of course, there are also some new parts, but morely, more or less it's uh, very condensed so that you get all that you need to know um, for this project group. And we will have it, this uh, lecture, ongoing weekly basically yeah so um so this is basically the final so we have 22 people i just want to see if everybody is there we will anyway have them later on in the seminar uh, assignment so we will see who is uh, not there so i can contact him because also for the lectures although they are recorded it's expected that you are here and we will also have some other elements in the lecture, not just uh, this frontal presentation, but I uh, would also like you to know yourself each uh, somehow better and uh, do a little bit of group work to, to see who's also in the group to get to know each other before having uh, the final presentation with the seminar. So in before you should already get to know each other. So that's why it's ne necessary to be also in the lecture. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's also on the last slide, so this is the home page. Somebody asked me where it can be found, it's not very intuitive. So I find it more convenient to go to the um, easier to remember website peerframework.com and there's also a um, um, part so where you can click to come to, to, to jump to the um, um, project groups website. So if you open the website, you can read a little bit about it. And here it is with the project group, and then you come directly to it. And I also put on the website the time schedule, the documents that you need, also the slides of the previous meetings. Um, and there are also the recordings, and yeah, so that you can watch them later on. Okay. Um, good. What else? Yeah, EasyChair, the li link to it. So we have a, that's, as I said last time, it's a conference management system. So that's the, our conference is called P2P Framework 2012. So that's where to register. And I invited you all, some of you already uh, um, accepted this invitation. Uh, the others should do, should do so as well. If you have any question, uh, write me an email. That's the best to, to reach me. Or you can also talk to me after the, the lectures, of course. Um, so, ah yeah. That, so that's the website for those who haven't seen it. The recordings, it, they, they will be all put online. And I also would like to, to use all this uh, technology that we have available to, to make it uh, convenient for us in the PG. So to have not just YouTube, but also to, to find probably other online tools to support us. Okay. so. One point was to we wanted to find another lecture date. Probably it's more convenient for you and for me. And um, the issue is, so it's still everything very full, and it's expected to have it uh, more relaxed next week. The only three dates, but I'm not sure if it's convenient, uh, would be either the date that we have now, or it's covering lunchtime, or it's Monday early, and uh, many lectures will so many Mondays are somehow holidays in the next month so that's not the best and if we go for the second room that's available because we need to have sufficient room for that amount of people 
um, that's also covering lunchtime and it's not so convenient. So what I would suggest is to not skip lunchtime, but uh, to go next week also for the same date, for the same time. And uh, so either we can agree to, to keep this time, or we, what, so at least the secretary has told me that uh, either this week or next, so or last week, uh, the rooms should be given free, so probably we have more uh, chances for better slots next week. So I would suggest to wait one further week. Okay. Um, probably it would be also advisable. So what I will do, once I know some further s time slots, I will also set up a doodle and send it around and everybody should participate in order so that you can say when do you have your lectures, when you have some free available time so that we come to a conclusion when most of us, hopefully all, can meet. Okay, um, coming to the, to the point of the seminar topic assignment, so I send around I think on Saturday the, the or Friday the a little bit uh, longer description on the seminar, seminar topics. So what the idea is, what should be covered in the semin uh, seminar paper. Uh, a new one was added because we had one person more. That's the gray one. Overview on decentralized online social networks. I don't want to go in all of the detail, into the detail of all of them. Because I hope that you all had a look at the document. All challenging questions, so graphic user this is more general graphical user interface, more um, the framework level, security, um, how to improve it in generally, and a little bit what's existing. And uh, so I ask you to participate in Doodle. And uh, up to yesterday, half past one, every, at least some, uh, some, some Doodle assignments were accepted. Then I closed it. And uh, now I applied the magic algorithm to this one. And uh, now you are probably interested for the results. So the the magic algorithm, basically, so I will go now through the topics and that will present who's covered in, in which topic. So, um, and that's also the point where I want to see if everybody's there. So um, the, the survey on social collaboration systems. Yes, so is the um, is principal Singi, uh, Saini available? Because he was somehow, I'm not sure whether he was responding to the mail, so is he here? No. Okay, then I know whom to contact. Sorry. Um, so, Supramanya Kuduvali, and I skipped your second last name. Okay. And Kangping Liu, I saw, yes. Um, ah, yes, for. The the new topic is covered by Nikhil Dara. Ah, okay. Marcel Sanders covering HTML. Okay. Uh, Lukman Ahmad. Okay. And uh, Shiam Sandi Polieni. Okay, good. So for those in grey, I uh, the the match was basically not based on their um wishes that was because uh, they either missed the the deadline to to make a vote or for one person i think it was just nothing left okay um let's go on um eugen maxin i saw yes okay uh that will be interesting hong jong sao i also saw yes and jens janjuk okay uh wai feng peng okay also yes paiman alavi was Hi, yes, there. <laughs> okay. Uh, Robert Mittendorf. Okay. That I have to check. It would be a pity that somebody's in the group and doesn't know about it. Um, Osama Shehadea. Shehadea, yes. Okay. Uh, good. Bahra Zirur. Okay. Uh, Bahra. Bahra, I also saw, yes. Lars Prima, hmm, yes, he's also there. Good. Alexander Mecker, I assume. Yes. And Shintan Parek. Okay, good. Um, Deepak Chandravena. Okay. I think you were, yeah. Alexander Morast. 
Okay. And Anastasia Petko, I think I also saw. Yes. Good. Okay. So um, this is the um, allocation basically on the of the seminar topics, and uh, I described in the the document um, what basically the, the questions are. What should what kind of questions should be elaborated and what kind of what is the main question that should be answered and um, I'm not sure whether it was um, exactly enough written so that's why it's anyway if you have some questions about what you should write or what sh kind of questions should be answered of course you can write me an email or ask me afterwards to, to, to make it sure that you cover it and um, it's also an approach to really make sure that the 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 relevant questions are addressed is that the first task in the seminar will be okay so the first task of the seminar will be to to basically describe in a s the, the paper structure and that will be um the the um, basically the um, yeah the elements of your f paper it will cover what you will write about and which kind of literature you will use that you should describe I will come to it uh, a little bit later how it could look like. So first of all, what kind of literature I can recommend? They are basically, of course, in the the one is hidden. Uh, of course, um, Schola Google to look for something. Wikipedia is not very recommended, but um, if you go for scientific papers, IEEE or ACM, that's good. If you have the opportunity to go to the library and have a look at this these books, they should be quite good. So for some of them, I also gave the um, links so you can download them to have a look. Okay, and um, that should be, but just as a starting point. So um, anyway, it's more. It will be more necessary to look yourself for kind of papers that that um, address your questions, and it will be also that I give you some starting papers, three probably, and uh, the question you have at hand and that you get starting to read the paper and then you find also further references and then you understand the topic more and then you can also find more successfully better and more related papers. Okay, yeah, what I was going to say is that the first, so that we have today, the seminar topic assignment and um, the first task after today will be on 1st of May to submit basically the paper structure and literature list. So I brought you some examples to, to show you what I mean with that. Um, and this is very small, so I jump to the next one. Okay, so here for example, uh, somebody um, that was a little bit too short, but it was basically showing the structure, so it has an introduction, he wants to talk about this and that and that topics. That's a little bit too small, so I will rather open the document. Uh, one moment. So, for example, that we don't need. Okay, so I consider this a little bit as too short, but basically it shows the, the what it should cover. So first, what the introduction should cover, which kind of um, topics should be discussed, uh, then there will be a section on definitions, then one protocol will be described, how it works, um, and related work, how other, so this is a replication um, mechanism, how it works, and the related work. So I, that's one example, of course, somehow I picked randomly the not the good one. Something better probably is this one, so it uh, shows uh, also how long the parts of the paper should be, what kind of, this was about security act attacks, so the Sybil attack for example will be explained, uh, the Eclipse attack will be explained, the routing attacks will be explained, then some um, approach how to handle it will be explained, this and that papers will be used, and that was a little bit better, so that was quite okay. And another example is uh, this one, this was about um, OSGI, that's basically how Life Social and this peer-to-peer -peer framework was basically structured and it describes what it is and basically, like you see, 
the, the paper structure should give a picture on how you, what kind of uh, um, sections and subsections you have, what kind of statements you want to give in that, what you want to describe in, th in these subsections, and which kind of literature you want to use in those subsections and sections. And the idea is that once you have such an overview about how you want to, to basically write your paper, this is probably two, th three, four pages, and it's much easier to restructure it, to, to, to change the argumentation uh, order or um, to, to put, um, to, to somehow shift the, the, the focus of the paper in this or that direction or to, to include further topics or drop some, some topics that are not relevant. So it's, e it's easier to give feedback on that kind of uh, overview on your paper than on the final paper because then it's much more work for you to, to change the document and the, the line of uh, yeah the line of arguments and that's why it's easier and the first step to really have this uh, paper structure as first submitted document basically okay and um, so what does this mean so that means that um, the first document that you create is such an overview so you would take the 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 LaTeX template that is on the website you set it up in your LaTeX um, program and um, you write basically down your structure and your, your sections and what you want to write in it and then you go to this easy chair you log in you should have already an account for it or at least I invited you and if you create ah, if you create your account please use your university of Paderborn um, email accounts that you also have in Paul because I invited you with that email addresses and you have you are linked to that email address basically and if you are now a program so a reviewer basically I, invi I invited you to become a reviewer and uh, if you use the same email address also as an author to, to register then you can choose between both roles easily otherwise you are two different persons in the system and that's quite inconvenient um, I will also show you a little demonstration of how it works so that you get a feeling for it it's really not big magic so what you should know is probably some yeah terminology okay so what you can do in um, easy chair and what you will we all will go through all the steps so first of all you submit your paper, your initial paper will be basically your uh, paper structure. Then you can bid as a in, a in your role as a reviewer for papers. So you can say I'm interested to review this and that paper. So there you will have to pick um, three papers I think. Yes. Then once uh, you you set your, your favorites, the, the tool automatically do does the matching so that most of the, the fav favorites are basically met and then you are assigned some papers to review to. Then you can download these papers and read it and upload the reviews and I think yeah and as an author again you, you get the reviews you can you should read them you should include that in your in your papers you should consider it and upload the new version of your paper again Okay, I think it's quite uh, straightforward. Um, okay, that one is not valid, so it's not two authors that I have to change. That was once valid for a seminar. Okay, so just to not have uh, wrong data on the, the slides. Okay. Yeah, your roles, author and um, program committee member, that means reviewer, and then you can switch between both roles if you use the same email address. Okay, again, the deadlines, so 1st of May and 29th of May, submission of the structure and the paper. Okay, so to really make it uh, sure that there's nothing misunderstood. Okay, and the deadline for bidding basically to say what you would like to review is in the middle so after two weeks after the, the structure has been submitted okay I want to show you um, how it works ok 
Okay, so you will. No, it should be three. Sorry. Okay, I will show you th s shortly how how this uh, looks like, so that uh, you get a feeling for it. Who of you did already log in and had a look at that? Okay, are you have you been in touch with it also previously somehow? Was it somehow no? No. Okay. Okay, so three papers will be assigned to each reviewer on uh, that day and some um, days later the reviews should be submitted. I will show you how it works because I'm still open for some reviews to do so it's easier to show. Okay, I mean that's nothing special so let's uh, have a look at it, how it looks like. So when I open EasyChair And uh, in the lucky case that the internet is available, then I can show it to you. Uh -huh. Okay. So we log in. And um, this is our um, project groups conference. Currently there's nothing um, inside, so no submissions, so I will show you for that case uh, some other conference. And that is the seminar of last semester. So there the submissions look like this, and if you if I change, for example, in my role as a as an as an um, sorry as a public committee member, I can do some reviews. So you will see if you log in with uh, your reviewer account, you will have some assigned some papers to review. So I'm in charge to review all of them, and uh, as you see, the the red ones haven't been uh, reviewed yet. So I would like to review this one for example or um, that one. Add a new review, okay. So you can write in who you are, but that's typically anyway uh, clear because it was individually assigned to you. Then you can uh, choose how well you liked it, very well written or bad written and how well you are familiar with the topic. And then you have a set of questions how what you think about the paper and you should take lots of time to really answer them thoroughly so very detailed and uh, the last time I also sketched in short what these reviews are about so it's about what is in the paper whether technical content is good enough so it's deep enough or too, too shallow how the language is or the pictures and or how no really just the language whether it's um, too redundantly too so just about the language how well the the in each individual chapter is written that you should comment how the presentation the figures tables um, coordinates that the t figures are the references how to further improve the paper and uh, just give in many aspects as much feedback as you can and then you can submit it. So that's it. So nothing uh, special. And this you have to do basically for three papers so that y there comes really a lot of uh, feedback together for each individual paper. Yes. Uh, do you have any questions for that? So how it works? So basically um, it's just logging in and in the time when there's no reviews yet available so that the papers haven't been uploaded you only have the submissions and then you can uh, decide to add a submission so that you can upload yourself a paper and um, if I give it free that you can review you also have this uh, review um, tab basically so that you can add the reviews and all of the rest I think this one this 
this and basically everything else will be hidden for you. Ah yeah, I can change some, um, just to show you how it looks like, if I choose some other person's view. Let's uh, pick, I don't know, that one. Log in as Adrian. So that's basically how he sees the the yeah easy chair. So he can only submit a paper or review and um, see ev events related to him. So nothing else. So that's very easy to use. Anyway, if you have some questions, you should ask, and you will you will all have to basically go through that struggle. So everybody else in the PG will have the same issue. So probably it's anyway will be solved easily. So do you have any questions uh, with in regard with this seminar topics or the assignment or the organization? So anything about yeah the organization basically or the deadlines or something unclear? It's probably not your first uh, seminar ever done, so um, probably only the tool is new, but um, I think anyway that uh, the structure is quite um, tight, so we'll you will get early feedback, so in one and then three weeks, if you s when you submit the structure of your papers, you will get your first feedback and then, then it's you're already in the process and everybody is basically uh, helped. Okay. So um, then I will would like to jump basically to um, the first beginning of the first lecture. Um, yes. So today and um, so be, uh, just some f words about the lecture, how it will be done. So first of all, so what do we have in this project group? So we have this peer-to-peer -peer framework and we have the social network on top of it. So you need a little bit background information on on peer-to-peer -peer and on this distributed data structures and uh, how all of it works. Uh, let's probably ask a little some questions about it. So who did already had some um, seminar or lecture on peer-to-peer -peer networks? One. Ah, okay. Five? Uh, or bachelor thesis probably also. Uh, six, okay. Uh -huh. Okay, that's, that's good to know. Because uh, I have some, and um, who had some focus, let's say, in the bachelor's or in the previous, in this current master on the networking. I mean, you can, let's say, shift your focus in the studies a little bit here, a little bit there. Who had more in the direction of networking? Okay. Okay, and. Um, so just to know how much uh, background information should be covered. Who is a member of a social network? Okay, you are not a member of a social network? A social network like Facebook? Yes, so who is not a member of Facebook? Oh. Okay, so what kind of other social networks are you members in? Do you have some other more popular ones that you use frequently? So I'm also s member in some other social networks, but I don't use them. So something else that you use more frequently, let's say once a week? Sorry? LinkedIn? Okay. Uh, something else than LinkedIn? Renren? Yes. The the big Chinese one, two hundred millions, I think. Okay. Uh, also, there's also Chinese Twitter, I think. Uh, Saibu. Yeah, Saibu Weibo. Something. <laughs> okay. Also in that, who's member in Twitter? Okay. Interesting. Then I'm will be interested in what kind of Twitter posts you do so what it can be used for S okay um, so LinkedIn Facebook Renton, something else some um, do you use some peer-to-peer -peer applications 
Nobody use Skype, okay, good. <laughs> Everything else will not be disclosed. Okay, good. So what I uh, will present in the lecture is basically all of a lot of background on peer-to-peer -peer because it offers basically two big applications, so file sharing, that's good, you have uh, data storage but uh, no personal attachment basically, so it's data for everybody and you have and uh, no inter no um, direct communication bec between the users, there are no real users available, you don't see them and you have Skype which is very user related, only direct communication, only audio or stream video streaming but no data storage and around it there are many many uh, research aspects but it didn't come really to some implementation and uh, we will cover in this lectures basically what peer-to-peer -peer is, how data can be stored in, in a peer-to-peer -peer network, how s it can be also secured, what kind of um, communication support we can give, how streaming can be done so that you have the, the understanding of how it all might work because at the end it's all individual elements that you can take individual solutions and put it in the framework basically and make it usable for the social network so that's very nice uh, separation of the mechanisms basically okay so I will start with the lecture and uh, if you have any questions just uh, ask in between okay so this uh, lecture today what it will cover basically is the introduction um, in peer-to-peer -peer is what peer-to-peer -peer is and um, where it has its success basically okay um, basically before peer-to-peer -peer there was uh, there there's the bigger topic of distributed systems and the idea is that you have really lots of resources available um, that might be programs data or devices and uh, to have it in this large quantity of course gives you the ability that you have more reliability so if one of it fails then you still have the rest you might have cost reduction to resource pooling so you don't need for each program individual resources but you can have a large area a large pool of resources and uh, reuse it for any kind of applications it scales better of course because you put more resources together so you extend the limitations and you can load balance and uh, you can use it for various aspects nowadays so a person to person is more this interaction person to machine is more this the storage and machine to machine is more so really that the users are not anymore involved so the idea of distributed systems is really from the historical point of view much older than peer-to-peer -peer and it gives just lots of uh, opportunities and uh, practical benefits and you have two types of distributed tape, uh, systems basically one is with the shared memory that was more from the 80s where you had uh, one big memory but many actors, many excess nodes using it o you can also think of CPUs or mm, systems using the shra same shared memory that was um, at that time, at the 80s, very popular and that's also still is for uh, customized um, hardware basically and you can optimize load distribution so for example you have it also in your multi-core um, yeah, PCs for example that's quite good, you can optimize load, you can for the user it's a centralized architecture so you don't see the differences which actor is using it currently and um, it's quite convenient to use but you have the problem that it's really hard to do once you have network communication inside so this is more practical for um, local data centers or local multi-core devices it's still distributed because you have many CPUs and many systems accessing and communicating and what um, is also basically the second aspect um, is the, the shared the, the not the shared memory but the, the distributed memory so each node and each actor has its own local memory and now the question is not anymore how to coordinate all these actors on the access to the memory but how to communicate and how to coordinate the nodes uh, with th their own memory basically in this network of course this can be both uh, on one device to have multiple nodes communicating with each other like for example software modules 
but it can be also of course also net in the network so that you have individual devices that communicate with each other and coordinate the actions by sending messages with commands what should be done and uh, one benefit in this is as you can see here the memory is the bottleneck at the end so if your memory cannot grow bigger than your system is limited and in this uh, the the bottleneck is basically the communication protocol so if they are working properly and effic efficiently then you can scale basically quite to very large networks okay and uh, now where is peer to peer in it so the ideas that came up basically in the late 90s with uh, Napster and um, other and MP3 was to my perspective also a very uh, driving factor is that on the one side the users got more and more resources um, to share I mean that means device capabilities so their bandwidth was not anymore modem but it got uh, ESDN or DSL so it was a little bit more than they really needed um, user generated content was avail available so with MP3 also the the files got small enough that you could uh, send it around and you didn't have to wait for hours and so you had with the resources growing uh, you have more and more of resources that you can share without any harm and you have basically these resources for free so CPU power memory if I don't use them then it's basically lost so I'm not um, ha harmed if I give it f um, yeah if I give it free and um, yeah, what so on the one side you have the devices, on the other side you have attractive resources like documents or services or storage space. So you had resources, but you also wanted to have other kinds of resources, and it was somehow the the vision to exchange the the resources, what you have and what you want to have. The question is, how do you find the resources that you want to have? For example, how do you find files that you are looking for? How do you find storage space that you want to use? And how do you can you offer your own, um, yeah, resources? So how can you bring together these uh, needs and uh, the and what is available? And if you look at the timeline, it's also supporting the the idea that even in future, this is not just a, a short-term trend, but also in future it will be still a big issue. On the left side, it's the Moore's law, showing how much resources you have available over the time, I mean that's you are studying computer science, sh that's something to know so the computer power is doubling every 18, mo every 18 months and uh, at least uh, it was said that it will continue like this so you will also have in future um, so ma much resources that you really can give large parts of it free and the second one is the gliders law I had to look it up but it was quite fitting and what it tells is that the bandwidth capacity triples every 12 months that you have available. And also, if you look in the future, we are already now the politicians are talking about introducing fiber, optical fiber to the homes with 100 Mbit or, or more. Of course, this will take some time, but it will come at the end sometime. And with LTE, um, so this um, long-term evolution of the, the mobile networking, also there the bandwidth is evolving so you will have more storage and more device capabilities more bandwidth available in the future and um, it's very natural that all of this is in, is in the user's hand and domain they have some needs they have s a lot of to offer and it's very natural to bring it together and to have algorithms to to make it available that you can have what you want by use by giving just your resources that you have and no centralized aspects inside ah another graphic another picture um, supporting this trend is um, the idea of ubiquitous computing that you have will have an increase of digital devices at home so this is at okay these are some german graphs but what they say is so what do you think how the, the future will look like and they say more devices basically and they are all interconnected and uh, so also you um, there are some um, 
hovering machines or, or vacuum cleaners that, that are already electrical and you can interconnect them. You might have um, intelligent uh, sensors, intelligent uh, switches everywhere in your house. So the devices are coming and making your life convenient. And this also brings lots of new capacities into the game that you can use. And also if you look at the private PCs increasing, they're still increasing in number, although there are some um, trends which say that the tablet PC will uh, will will end this um, boom of private PCs, but I'm not I'm not sure. Okay, so concludingly, the resources are growing, and also in future, if it's not tomorrow, not next year, but in five years, the the trend is on our side basically because there are sufficient resources at hand that can be used. Okay, so the the, the question was, how can we find in this large network of, of devices with lots of resources, how can we find now the resources that we are looking for? So files or storage space or so for example if you want to build an application like a social network you would like to have um, for a streaming application oh no, let's say some other example, for example I want to put this recording online in the social network and give it free to you to watch. So I need some storage space, so I'm looking for nodes with specific storage and I want to have some indexing node that is always online and knows where the data is located. So how can this be currently done? So currently what is happening is you have um, an index server so you have only the servers on the one side like there and um, so for yeah so how is it done currently? So if you are looking for example for the, the lecture recording nowadays you would ask Google, this is the index, knowing where data is located, where do I find it in the internet, and it tells you at the website of the University of Paderborn. And then you can download it directly. And uh, there's nothing intelligent in the network, basically. And uh, what can, but what can be done is uh, to basically have an advanced network so that you do not ask one centralized index where data is located, but you ask the network where data is located uh, so that you just make the statement I would like to have this recording and the network, whoever this is, uh, tells you where you can find it and this is more easier to use basically for the nodes because more transparent so you do not care who's answering you at le until you uh, f at least you are happy when you find your data that you're looking for so here the network's basically dump, it doesn't do anything, it just sends messages from A to B and here the network is intelligent uh, which resolves you the queries and which has a uh, lots of functionality and this is basically what is said to be the future. There's also not just peer-to-peer -peer, which is basically a network on top of a network but there's also the idea of uh, content-based networking which says the internet itself should not be sending a message from IP A to IP B but it should be content aware so nowadays it's not possible but in future probably it will be okay so the question is and uh, that's where peer-to-peer -peer fits, fits in so you have all these large networks everybody has something to share and everybody wants something from the network the question how do you find each other so which of the nodes provide the resources that you are looking for and um, if you are providing um resources if you want to give it free to whom should you give it so which instance of the resource should be shall be provided so how to find it and whom to give it and of course p2p is a good option we will also talk about why not everybody's using it but at least it seems that it's very natural that you can find documents and or whatever you, you look for and um you the, the nodes serve each other and once so you have this uh, clever overlay network which helps you in finding the content that you're looking for in the second step after finding it um, the nodes contact each other and request the service or the resources directly and get it but the clever part is basically in how the network the peer-to-peer -peer network resolves these queries and there's a lot of intelligence in it so that you can do lots of functionality and, and can put in lots of features. And one main uh, 
characteristic that should be known is basically the, the, the concept of overlay networks. So what is an overlay? An overlay is basically if you have various networks then you pick some of them, of these uh, lower level networks, these let's say internet networks, you pick nodes from it and they create a new network with their own addressing scheme, so they don't use IP addresses but they use PIDs, they do not use uh, the routing, so they assume that they can send a message from A to B, but here they have different addressing and they offer a, a different functionality, so basically up in this overlay. So an overlay is basically using the functionality of the lower networks to create something better and to offer more functionality so that you can have different kind of services supported by this overlay. So the overlay gets intelligent by by that means. And uh, so what does it mean? Here again, so you have the network, the several networks below that might be, for example, I'm uh, located, so I'm in the internet via VLAN, I'm some somehow else participating in the net internet, and all of them, if they participate in that overlay, they have a unified uh, new addressing s uh, scheme and they can communicate additionally and um, yeah, additionally on it. So I think the, the idea should be somehow clear that you have basically on top of previous layers using the functionality of that underlying networks a new overlay network which offers you more uh, features, basically more functionality so it's an yeah, an additional layer. Um, ah, it's also that the IP network is, for example, an overlay network. So if you take the different kind of MAC layers or the the, the local networks, so VLAN and and um, DSL networks and uh, what el what kind of other access networks you have for the internet that you can also think of, you have all these localized uh, small access networks and they are participating in the internet with uh, their own um, addressing scheme and that's also one type of overlay. So just the idea, you have, you have this layering and you use the lower layers to, to create some, some further and improved functionality on higher layers. Typically what's what it brings is that the new layer, the overlay, has its own addressing scheme, has its own routing, has its own um, error me detection mechanisms. So it's all having its additional functionality. So what's the good about it? So first of all, you can introduce new functionality. So with peer-to-peer, for example, that you can look for documents in an um, in a um, typical internet you cannot, so you can only send a message with an IP sender A to a receiver IP um, destination B, for example. So you can only have node-to-node -node communication and with a P2P overlay you have, for example, this content-related search. So new functionality, that's good. Um, of course, you can also have it on lower la layers somehow solved, but at the, the, the higher layer basically implements this feature for you. S and um, another approach for example to, to lock look for um, content would be to change all the IP routers to support it also the same functionality but it's really not practical so if you have an overlay you do not have to deploy new equipment you do not have to uh, modify existing software protocols on the IP layer but you put a new functionality on top of it as a new layer and only those node networks and all those nodes who want to participate, they participate and for them it's working and for the rest, rest it isn't but the rest and the further nodes are also not touched basically by, by this overlay network. What's also good is you do not have to change the whole internet to work so you don't have to um, yeah, that means you, you can bootstrap, so you can have single nodes joining each by another and you don't, your your overlay network can grow slowly and you don't have to change 
all of it like you would have to, for example, with IPv4.6. So if you want to have the features of IPv4.6, the larger IP uh, address uh, base, for example, what is typi what would be required is to really change uh, all of the internet protocols that are in used at one day, and it's hardly doable. And um, yeah, that's an example. So IP on top of Ethernet doesn't require to modify Ethernet protocol or driver. So it just uh, works for those who want to use it. Drawbacks is, of course, you might have redundant uh, imp redundant um, implementation and functionality. Of course, you have also packet headers and processing and further traffic overhead. Uh, the complexity grows. So um, you have more and more layers, more and more functionality. You get interdependencies between the layers, um, misleading behavior. So for example, if one error on some lower level happens, it might be interpreted as error on some higher level. So you have to consider that the more layers you have, the more complex your software becomes. And if you have some error somewhere, it's harder to detect course you might have redundancy so if you have for example error control that's in TCP that's also partially in IP that you could also uh, have in your application so you have the same feature same functionality on various layers that's wasting traffic and um, s it's also that if you don't have some features for example real-time capabilities or security on lower levels then you cannot get them on higher levels because you need the basis and the foundation but okay, that's all doable. So what we should take as an outcome of this overview is basically with overlays you get more functionality. It's easy to introduce and to apply, but we have to have more complexity and uh, more overhead. But okay, traffic is not uh, that big issue. Okay, here are two examples. So first of all, what kind of overlays do we have? So okay, peer-to-peer -peer that they, they offer this storage and retrieval and search. For that we will all have some, some examples later in the following lectures. But there are also non-peer-to-peer -peer overlays. So for example, virtual private network. Also they can create a small network on their own with their own addressing. And it's with additional features and functionality that is on top of existing overlays. Or you can also have application layer multicast. That means if you want to reach various nodes as destination nodes, you can have it as additional application doing it for you because IP cannot. Or Tor, the, the onion-based anonymizer, it's also additional overhead that basically adds some additional features for your um, routing. Okay, so this is the concept of overlays, basically more features but also more traffic and the question is now what kind of features do we need and um, how can we do them in uh, this peer-to-peer -peer environment? And what does it mean, peer-to-peer -peer environment? So what, how do the nodes look like? That we also have to clarify. So first of all, what is peer-to-peer? -peer? Uh, very generally, it's a collection of individual computing devices, let's say nodes, uh, that communicate with each other and interact directly with each other. Okay, that's very general distributed systems that we had with non-shared memory and um, yeah, what that, that means for peer-to-peer -peer is that the nodes yeah, basically are loosely coupled, they can only communicate with messages um, they can only, they all have their own agenda basically so they all do what they want to do, of course they follow some protocols mainly and that's why something happens but uh, you cannot enforce them to do anything that you want. Okay, so this is now an overview. Get so we're getting to the characteristics of peer-to-peer -peer networks that make it special and that also re results in some ch challenges because it's not easy to, to have clever protocols in peer-to-peer -peer networks. Okay. Ah, this figure just shows, so for example, this is your IP network, for example. On top of it, you have the P2P network and P2P um, service delivery. So this peer direct communication, if you, for example, transfer files, also coming to play. And uh, yeah, 
Okay, let's see, what are the, the, the characteristics of peer-to-peer? -peer? So what makes it special and difficult to really find solutions that are good working? So first of all, all the relevant resources like storage and computational power and all what you can use is in the hand of private nodes. So you cannot control them and they voluntarily offer it. So if your users do not give more storage space than they do, you cannot force them because you don't have access to them, you can't ask them. It's just, you can only use what they offer. What else? So the resources they offer are very heterogeneous, so very different. So you have, let's say, 1000 nodes. Some offer lots of bandwidth, some only very limited bandwidth, some lots of CPU power, some very small. So everything what they offer is different. So you cannot rely on anything. You just have to take and use somehow what they offer voluntarily. And it's also very distributed, so you don't know where it is. And so there's, of course, no structure that tells you where you can find these um, uh, resources. So you have to have proper mechanisms to find the resources that you're looking for. So this is about the uh, resources. So for especially these two make it very difficult to really have efficient mechanisms to find what you are looking for in that quantity, di quantity that you are needing the networking. So one aspect that is really very important, even one of the very critical aspects is churn. Churn means in English basically if you have coffee and you have a spoon in it and you steer it around and makes the circles that means churn. That I Technically it means you have this dynam dynamics and changes all the time so it's always dynamic with the nodes going online and offline so variable connectivity it's very unpredictable so you don't know how many nodes will come online how long they will stay online what motivates them they have different connection times they go online offline and you just have to react you cannot predict basically how can the nodes interact as it was said they uh, serve each other so they are both re users so clients and servers of each other that's very special and they interact directly. So there are no nodes in between, so peer-to-peer, -peer from node to node. And uh, the, the last two points, um, because these nodes are in the hand of private people, typically, the nodes have also their, sig their, their own autonomy. So they, they do what they want, and uh, they have mostly the similar rights, they mostly have the similar roles. It would be good if it's based on the capabilities, but typically uh, the nodes have to be used as they are and you, you have to consider that probably they are also malicious and you cannot control them. And last of all, because you have this large network, it can only work and it can only offer you some functionality if the nodes are self-organizing. So Although all the nodes are different, they do probably what they want. You have to find a protocol that requires them to perform in a specific way so that automatically, self-organizingly, the behavior that you want to have emerges. So you want... It can only be done self-organizingly. I mean, you don't have any centralized control, centralized uh, ruler that tells each node what has to be done so they ha all have to communicate and coordinate themselves to to make themselves in a state uh, that it's working fine and the function is offered that you need so very challenging requirements and and and, and uh, issues so everything is private you have to use what they give it's all different it's all distributed over the world so you have very many resources but very hard to access. They are all going online and offline all the time, so that you have to consider. But you can only use the nodes because they are also servers and clients in one. They can only communicate with each other, no centralized nodes. So very challenging to, to really make useful uh, mechanisms. Okay, still there are some um, applications out there, but just telling, uh, showing you this uh, picture, they are basically um, only three big application types we'll talk about. Basically, it's uh, file sharing, Kazaa and Nutella and BitTorrent. 
and Emule. There's Skype for audio conferencing, and there's um, PP Live and Zatu or something similar for video streaming. These are the big uh, issues and uh, the big applications, but still it's very popular and millions of users are using it. And I think Skype has daily at least uh, 30 or 50 million users uh, using it and um, also file sharing networks have been uh, observed having uh, f up to 10 million users and it was operating very well. Of course they had to wait a bit to t for their files to download but nobody was paying and everybody was happy and technically it is a good solution. And hopefully sometimes there will be also some logo of the peer-to-peer -peer framework for social networks. Okay, and <coughs> looking at the history, peer-to-peer uh, -peer was very dominant mainly in the, in the late 2000s where peer-to-peer -peer traffic was very dominating basically. Uh, since 2003, more than 50% of, of the internet traffic was peer-to-peer, -peer. even um, 60 to 80 percent in the backbone of the internet, at least in Germany, there we had some measurements was uh, file sharing, but since uh, some years now video streaming uh, dominates, uh, like YouTube, Hulu, Netflix, also um, uh, Mega Upload, that was also sometimes in the, the charts, I mean now that it's more convenient to download the movies and uh, the, video, uh, the, the audio streams from the internet via one-click hoster, the people shifted to towards that more convenient websites. Probably sometimes they will shift back because uh, now they are the, the, the media industry is attacking that one-click hosters and it's getting difficult for them to operate. <coughs> okay, some studies from 2008-2009. Um, blue is peer-to-peer -peer and it's just showing it's still more than, let's say, 50% was uh, measured and proved that it's peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, so it's still very relevant. And it's very important to know how these protocols work that make most of the traffic in the internet. Okay. Um, some dominant applications that were very prominent in history. Um, it was all starting with eDunkey and Kazaa, probably some of you knew that. And then came a little change with BitTorrent, which was basically um, the new and still remaining file sharing um, mega trend basically so most of the if you have uh, file sharing uh, then most of the people use BitTorrent Skype is still there and the rest gets irrelevant so Kaza, Kaza and download and Emule is getting irrelevant and 2009 there are these uh, trends of video streaming so PP Live and Views um, and uh, they all support you in watching TV or watching videos over the internet in this peer-to-peer -peer fashion. Yes, and of course, the future will only have place for distributed social networks because there's really some gap that's coming together. So on the one side, social networks, they, they all are in this critique that they, they misuse your data. And on the other side, the, the technology is av available, or at least it will be available after the, the end of this PG. To, to really have uh, this efficient distributed social network, so probably this will catch up. Um, Pre-last slide, I think. So the question is, um, why doesn't it, uh, so where do you find P2P in business? So Skype, okay, and uh, file sharing, that's not really that you something that you use in a company. So what, what is with P2P in the business world? So first of all, it's easy to de deploy a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, overlay with a new service, with something like Skype, so you offer it and people can use it. And it's also very, there's also a trend towards group collaboration. Uh, so we have been at the CeBIT and there are some many startups that have these uh, social intranets that support you in doing your work with your co-workers, with your colleagues, that you have your own um, company-wide social network, that's also coming. And the, the major triangle, basically what business application should have, of course it should be very cheap. Um, 
it should be very easy to use and it should be very good. And somehow um, that's hard to do in one place. Of course, peer-to-peer -peer is very cheap, so it costs nothing. It might also be easy to use, but it's the question whether the quality is good enough so that peop people really want to use it. And uh, everything can be addressed. And so many aspects of the, the project group are already are managed, are addressing these aspects, and um, so that the the, the overall um, social network can be improved. Yes, I think this is uh, yes. Okay, so the the so in which fields are typically peer to peer research? Where is it done? So first of all, lots of research is, is done in the overlays. So how can a good overlay be done? Therefore, we also have uh, in the seminar I think two or three topics on how to improve it in data storage, how to improve it in in, um, in routing, how to improve it in many aspects of security. So that's also uh, storage and replication. Streaming is a very big topic in peer-to-peer -peer research because this is really a new trend that you want to watch TVs or movies over the internet and there are several solutions available and that that's really a trend so there's lots of research going on. What's also relevant um, that's also covered by at least one seminar paper is monitoring and quality control. That means if you have a peer-to-peer -peer network running how can you see how good it is? So you do not want to just be user of it and hope that it's well performing, but you want to know, for example, how the lookup times and the answering times for one um, um, profile, for example, is. So how is the average time to look up a profile in the network? Is it good enough or not? And if it's too bad, then uh, you want to have some control mechanism that improves the quality. So quality control is an issue. Security is all the time a big issue. I mean, any distributed network can be attacked and if you have one million users or 1,000, then 10% of it will try to destroy your network because they are evil. So you have to take countermeasures and make sure that they cannot do it. And of course, uh, there's an issue in a big research aspects on new PHP applications, but this is also not really um, that true. So they m there are some pop-ups of new peer-to-peer -peer applications, but they are very rare. And what I think is uh, quite missing was this peer-to-peer -peer framework that allows you to create really new applications quite easily. So you don't have to reinvent every overlay and everything again for every new application, but to have only one big framework and have small applications on top of it that are quite easily working and um, so this project group is exactly addressing this aspect to build on this framework so that you can build many kinds of applications and it's very easy to build new applications, new plugins and uh, to make it uh, that way very easy to have effective and well working applications. And so we will see a lot of um, yeah lectures on, so uh, some lectures on on the background of it, so how to how we can do it and what is needed for that, and that's also my last slide for today. Um, so next week, so do you have any questions for that? If not, so we will uh, meet. I would suggest next week uh, at this time here again. Um, we will start at quarter past four. That. Next week it will also take, let's say, 90 minutes, the, the lecture, so like a regular lecture. And if you have any questions about your um, seminar topic, send me an email. What I will also do is uh, to each individual topic to send you a set of papers to start with, because that's anyway needed. Okay, so if you don't have any further questions, then thank you very much and see you next week.